when it is ready. Seminar members, you don't have to do that. I have you all on a list, that I, a shorter list that I can send it to. So uh, with no further ado, I'll turn it over to Tom Boomershine. Well, this is a great occasion uh, and uh, it comes at a propitious time. Uh, the book is, uh, I have the final proofs. I only need now to edit the indexes and uh, it'll be off to publication. The title is First Century Gospel Storytellers and Audiences, colon, The Gospels as Performance Literature. Uh, so I've given you, and we decided to focus just on one article. There are 10 uh, in the book, and uh, I'll refer to one or two of them, but uh, I've, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens with this. Uh, a, uh, a summary of 40 years of research and the significant part of which has been the research of uh, telling the stories of the network of biblical storytellers and the work that it has done, the network of biblical storytellers seminar and all that that has been. Uh, that's been, all of that has been a central part of this uh, work and so uh, I want to summarize briefly uh, this article uh, and call attention to, uh, I don't know, the major things in it. Uh, so this will be uh, as brief as I can make it. And uh, we'll see how that goes. I do have a clock here, so for your comfort. Uh, so the Gospel of Mark, audience address and purpose in the performance of Mark. Uh, this article is based on a shift in exegetical focus from the assumption of texts read by readers, which has been ubiquitous in biblical scholarship. Uh, I've just picked up a few commentaries and the reader is all over the place. Uh, and audience does not uh, generally occur. There are, have been a couple exceptions to that, but not many. So it's the shift from texts read by readers to compositions performed for audiences and is based on uh, research into the sound of the stories. Uh, in one of the articles, uh, I have a long section on the structures of the brain, uh, the uh, structures of sound and sight. And implicit in this uh, series of essays is the, uh, the conclusion that when the compositions are heard, that they are literally a different set of sense perceptions than when they are read in silence with the eyes. It's literally a different story uh, and is a different set of data. And uh, to a significant degree, I would uh, argue that much of biblical scholarship has been focused on a misperception of the gospel of the Bible as it was originally composed and perceived. Uh, so that we're actually starting a whole new body of research based on the analysis and study of the sounds of the story. It happened, this awareness of audiences and how much difference that makes happened for me once when uh, in a Gospel of John class, we performed the whole gospel. And in the middle of that, as a person was uh, telling the, uh, the 
chapters 13 and 14, uh, the Last Supper uh, discourse, I suddenly realized that as I was looking at this person, and that person had become, for me, Jesus, was presenting Jesus' words, and I was being addressed as disciple, as one of those, you know, around the table. And that business of audience address then uh, permeated my research after that because it was clear to me that that was a major factor in the experience of the Gospels. Now, in Mark, uh, the uh, The story is, a re the text, the manuscript, is a recording of sound. Uh, I'd recommend uh, Margaret Lee and Bernard Brandon Scott's book, uh, Sound Mapping the New Testament. Uh, and I also have here the proofs for a second edition, which is even better than the first edition. Uh, but I would recommend that to everyone. Uh, in relation to this reconception of the Bible as sound. It is literally then a different set of sense perceptions. Uh, so the original medium was sound and the gestures of storytellers. Uh, that's what the audiences saw, not marks on a page. Uh, the conclusion that emerges from a study a systematic study of audience address in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, and there is a chart that is part of this uh, paper that is distributed that I would suggest that you not just study, but also experience. That is to consciously identify uh, with uh, the storyteller and uh, with the audiences that are addressed and see what uh, emerges from that experience. Uh, most of the time, the storyteller in Mark addresses the audience as him or herself. Uh, so at the beginning, uh, the storyteller uh, is saying to the listeners as themselves, this is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way, and so on. This is uh, the storyteller addressing the audience as themselves. When the storyteller becomes a character, it's usually Jesus. Uh, and it's Jesus addressing a variety of other characters. The audience becomes then that other character. Uh, so a primary difference between story and drama is that the primary action in a story happens between the storyteller and the audience, whereas the audience in drama primarily is observing something that's going on on a stage above and where the interaction is between actors who are presenting various characters. So the characters in uh, the stories, uh, and then there's a story of Mark, are the characters who are addressed in the story and the audience is addressed as those characters. So what emerges from a systematic a uh, listing of those is that the audience is almost always addressed as various groups of Judeans. Uh, and that includes uh, Pharisees, scribes, uh, the uh, disciples, uh, the 12, uh, the crowd, uh, so there are, you can look through that chart and identify uh, those moves in relation to the audience. Mark what uh, 
can be inferred from the character of the story is that Mark was a Greek speaking Judean, a Greek speaking Jew who was addressing audiences that were predominantly Jewish uh, rather than being uh, members of uh, Christian congregations as has often been assumed in Markan scholarship. Uh, there, is a dis there are distinct patterns that emerge from the study of audience address. Uh, the first is that there's a pattern of addressing the audience as engaged in conflict with Jesus to a position of intimacy. Uh, so the first of those happens with the controversies, the conflict stories in two and three uh, that have their climax in uh, the scribes who came up uh, down from Jerusalem uh, calling Jesus Beelzebul and Jesus responding that those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit will be guilty of an eternal sin. Uh, so there's an escalation of the conflict that happens uh, in that. And immediately after that, then, the audience is invited to identify with the group sitting around Jesus. Uh, and uh, they are addressed then as my brother, my sister, and my mother. So there's this radical shift in audience address from the extreme escalation of conflict to then a time of intimacy, which continues then in uh, chapter four with the parable of the sower and the various parables and commentaries on that uh, parable. So there's a move from opposition to belief and discipleship. Uh, so uh, this can be seen even more clearly in the Gospel of John, where for the first four chapters, the audience is addressed as various uh, Jewish communities. Beginning in five, going through chapter 12, there is a clear description and change in the audience as being addressed as Judeans who variously believe and do not believe in Jesus. Uh, and then from 13 through 17, it's the longest address of Jesus to the disciples. So the audience is invited then to participate in that uh, encounter between Jesus and the disciples. Uh, The characteristics of Mark's audiences that then emerge from this study of audience address are first that they are addressed primarily as Judeans, as Jews. Non-Jews are a minor but integral part of the address of the audience. The translation of Aramaic and Hebrew uh, terms indicates that the audiences were Greek speakers. Uh, the invitation to move from opposition to identifying with discipleship implies that the audience uh, was not uh, believing Christian communities, but was rather uh, persons who did not uh, believe in Jesus as Messiah, uh, but who were invited to move from uh, opposition, conflict in relation to Jesus, to a position of uh, belief and discipleship. Uh, another dynamic that I identify in the paper is that the audience is invited to move from being part of crowds interested in listening to Jesus uh, to being identified as Jesus' disciples. And there's a very clear move in the story when it's heard as a whole and analyzed in relation to audience address. That happens several times in the gospel. So the historical, the question of then, what are the implications of this 
for the historical character, you know, the quest of the historical mark and audience. Uh, what can be said on the basis of this analysis is that the gospel is structured for address to Greek speaking, predominantly Jewish audiences who did not believe in Jesus as the Messiah. And there's a long process in the hearing of the gospel and its performance of uh, audience inclusion and of invitations to the audience to move from a position of being outside and interested in Jesus to being a part of his inner circle. Uh, now, an implication of this is that Markan scholarship needs to re-examine the conclusion that Mark was anti-Jewish. Uh, in the context of this uh, analysis, the, the conflicts can be seen as intra-Jewish rather than anti-Jewish, that it is then in continuity with books such as Jeremiah, Exodus, uh, the prophets, uh, where there is intense conflict uh, with uh, communities in the community of Israel that are part of this experience, but uh, in which those end with appeals in various ways to be part of the community of Israel. Uh, the overall conclusion is that performance changes the perception of Mark and of the Gospels, and that studying them then systematically as performance literature results in a different perception of what they were, what their meaning was, what their purpose was, and how they were communicated in the ancient world. So that's a brief summary. That's I'll true. be interested in your comments. And uh, so, I'm, I'm very grateful for this time, and, uh, and I'm delighted at the publication of this book when it happens. Thank you so much, Tom. You did it. You were brief. <laughs> <laughs> I applaud you. Um, so I would like, uh, I'm going to move us to a screen where we can see more people and Tom now to gal review. Um, if you want to speak, I think it's best if you use, if you can do this. I don't know if it's easy to do on an iPad, but use that raise hand function because it puts you in order on my screen, so I know how, what order to call you in. Um, as Joanna has just done, you can see that. And then, um, if not, raise your hand, and I'll try to keep my eyes out for you. But it's easier for me to track if we do as Joanna did. So Joanna, uh, you you can go first. Unmuted. There, you're unmuted. You're on. <laughs> okay. Tom, and I think I've been through this with you before on this. <laughs> I think there's a logical problem in all of this. And I'm going to read a section that you wrote on page 18. And then I will say what I want. The Go final ahead. address to the audience in Mark's story by the storyteller as a character. Uh, is the address of the storyteller as the young man dressed in white to the audience of Mary Magdalene, Mary, and Salome. Skipping slightly. The audience's identification with the women has been established in the stories of their presence at Jesus' crucifixion and burial. As a result, the audience experiences the young man's words as addressed to them. Uh, I agree with you. But I don't think that audience is all women. And similarly, in the issue of being addressed as Jews, the fact that the audience is addressed as Jews does not mean they are predominantly Jewish, any more than that if the men are included in the women's address, it means they're suddenly all women. Now, I, I think much of your article holds uh, certainly, uh, the the movement from outsiders to disciples, Ecclesia disciples, works. But I don't think the fact that the audience is asked to assume the position of Jews means that they are necessarily Jewish. 
Now, it doesn't mean they're necessarily not Jewish. It is, I think, a neutral argument in that regard. I don't see how if they, the men can hear the women is addressed to them, Gentiles couldn't hear the Jewish is addressed to them. Oh, right. Certainly. Uh, that's fully possible. Uh, but it is striking in the context of Markan scholarship, which has generally, uh, frequently uh, identified uh, the readers as members of Gentile Christian communities uh, who are not explicitly not Jewish, that this reverses that uh, identification and changes the perception of the audience. Now, in relation to the women, uh, I think it's fully possible for, uh, I don't know, both genders uh, or three or four genders as uh, uh, we are increasingly having uh, to identify with uh, various characters. Uh, that's a characteristic of fiction, of narration, of story, is that the impact of a storytelling experience is inclusion. Uh, and that people can identify with uh, people who are radically different than, uh, than they are. And uh, so I agree with you about that, that, uh, that the address to of the young man to the women can readily be experienced by men as identifying with the women. Uh, so, I agree with you about that. Yeah. But I do think it weakens your argument. That not so, I think it, your argument that Mark is not as acutely anti-Jewish, I think does stand, but I think you cannot argue that the audience is predominantly Jewish from that because it is assuming the identity of the audience with the audience address, which I don't think can be done. Right. And that's a, that's a major question, issue in relation to you know, performance criticism, uh, is what is the impact uh, on audiences uh, in relation to the dynamics of stories as they're experienced by audiences. Um, so I do think that it is important to recognize that the audiences are addressed in the telling of the story as various groups of Judeans predominantly. The only place where there's an exception to that in terms of ethnic groups is the discussion about the dietary laws in chapter seven. This, this is true, but I would also argue since Jesus, except for the Syrophoenician woman and the Gerasene demoniac is in Jewish territory, you would expect the audience to be Jewish. And I'm not sure how much can be inferred from that. Right. Any rate, others go on. Elizabeth, you wanna go next? You're still muted, Elizabeth. She has an iPad and is probably trying to figure out how to do it. You don't know. I, I, I haven't. I'm in. There you I'm are. I'm in a hotel lobby with. We're losing you, Elizabeth. I I can summarize a little. But now. Mm -hmm. She's in a hotel lobby with a device she normally doesn't use, so that's complicating things. Okay. Hey. Here's the problem. Every time I hit mute, nothing happens. So I hit it again. It's just you're not iPad. muted it's now. Really, you're okay. Really you're good now. Slow. No. We hear you. I'm, I'm fine now. There. I'm with that. I'm not used to slow. Okay. So it's interesting to come right after Joanna because, um, gosh, we've been agreeing with each other for what 40, 50 years. But I, I want to say a similar thing, Tom. But um, 
a little bit broader because you say at the beginning of your chapter that you, you know you, you critique, if I would too, bringing the bringing external information to the story to tell what the meaning of the story is. You know, there've been people who have done that. They have to know all the history and then they tell what the meaning of the story is. And you say, no, no, you should read it out of the story. But yet you do the opposite move. You you do a very careful. I love this dynamics of the storytelling where you you show how all the listeners are brought along uh, to get closer and closer to Jesus. And I buy that completely. What I don't buy is therefore you use this internal evidence to talk about external situations of who the real people were in the audience. And I think that's the goof. Because when you, when you do that, and I think Joanna was saying this too, you, you, it's almost as if you're limiting the imagination of the audience. When Mark is definitely not limiting the imagination of the audience. Mark is assuming the audience can imagine ourselves in all these different roles and come along and, and rhetorically lead us to this endpoint. And you, you show that so beautifully in your work. What I don't like is then you conclude, conclude from that gorgeous reading of the dynamic of the storytelling, you conclude something about the people who happen to be standing around in the first century. That's a gap. It's a jump. And you can make a jump. But, but it is a jump. You've jumped out of your... Um, You've jumped out of my view now, too. <laughs> uh, you've jumped out of one dimension to another. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Hola, would you like to go next? And I, would, I would fully acknowledge that, Elizabeth. And, uh, and I think it's a legitimate move. Uh, but I understand uh, why you would have that objection. I guess I would just say, get your salt shaker out when you make the move, you know, because when we go from internal evidence to external conclusions, we're always jumping over a gap. And we should just say, you know, jumping over a gap here, folks. Um, and of course, everybody else has been doing it too. And you might have better arguments for your gap jumping than somebody else's. Well, and some I of it's just your chicken and don't want to jump over that many gaps. Right. I do uh, think and am persuaded that the Gospel of Mark is written in the aftermath of the, of the war and that that's a major factor in the meaning and impact of the story that uh, has, that one of the uh, achievements of Mark and scholarship over the last, I don't know, 30 years or so has been the recognition of the centrality of the war as but the background of the story. Uh, so I would put those two together. Uh, so I would, this is not to argue that there is no value to extrinsic methods of literary criticism. It's rather a, an appeal uh, to uh, not have that be the dominant methodology, which has to this point excluded uh, hearing the story. Shola, you wanna go next? Yes, please. I don't have so much of a question, but more of a contribution in light of what Joanna and Elizabeth were saying. The way I understood the identification with the audience in, in Mark's gospel wasn't so much as thereby, because these are the people Mark is addressing in the gospel. Therefore, this is who the the hearers of the story were. The way I understood it is more in, in within the framework of, of when we listen to a story, what a story is supposed to do is to draw people into the world of the story and become characters with, within the story, which may or may not have any bearings of who they are apart from the story and who they become after that. But that in the moment, like the... I think they call it like a community that is being formed in the act of a live teller with a group of people listening. Like in that world of the story, the audience is the, are the women, the different groups of people addressed, which may or may not align with who they are 
outside of the world of the story, which I think um, in that regard, the, the, the jumps that are made in terms of who the audience, I think it pretty much works as long as we're in the world of the story. Right. That is a, the, that's a significant move here. I will fully acknowledge. Uh, uh, I think it's a valid move uh, because uh, storytellers want to communicate with audiences. Uh, all of us who have had uh, significant experience as storytellers know uh, what it is to lose an audience and to have them become not co-participants in the story, but rather alien critics. And uh, it's awful. Uh, <laughs> really, it's not really fun at all on either side. Uh, so I think there is the probability that the uh, identification of how the audience is addressed is significant for identifying who the uh, audiences were because of the realities of storytelling experience. Uh, you can't address an audience as your enemy uh, and hope that they are going to uh, be uh, drawn into the story. It's just, it's just not going to happen. So it is, it is a big jump. I uh, will acknowledge that. Marty? Um, this, this is another old conversation, um, but I, I missed, uh, maybe it was there and I missed it, uh, a discussion of why we should assume that anytime Jesus addresses someone as you, that that is whom the audience is identifying with. Uh, I absolutely know the experience you're talking about as both a teller and as an audience person yes. of, of someone, a character in the story is speaking, the storyteller temporarily becomes that character and is talking to me. I know that. And, and I don't question one little bit uh, that that happens. But other times when I am telling a story or watching someone else tell a story, uh, they'll place the characters who are talking neither with them as ones that they and the audience are watching. So he said to her, but she said, and that doesn't necessarily mean then that when Jesus is talking to somebody, that person is who the audience is supposed to identify with. It could be that they're identifying with the storyteller in rolling their eyes at how much that person who's being addressed doesn't get it and they should be smarter and I can feel good about myself because I'm, <laughs> I'm an insider. It, yeah, it, I would so like much. to hear you discussing certainly the existence of that dynamic in storytelling I've heard and in the telling of stories of Mark that I've heard uh, because it appeared in the essay that you were almost assuming if the word you was used in speaking to someone that that meant the audience would, that that meant they, the teller was actually looking at the audience and the audience was supposed to step into the place of the you. Right. And I think that does happen in the passion narrative, especially in the trials where the, uh, the uh, audience is addressed as so as for example the uh, the Sanhedrin how does it appear to you uh, is a question that is then addressed to the audience directly uh, so uh, but I I hear what you're saying in relation to the you know he addressed to uh, he said, she said, uh, and that dialogue. And that's part of uh, a storytelling convention. Uh, Dennis Dewey uh, does that kind of dialogue 
brilliantly in my experience. He does it more uh, as in a more integral way than I've ever been able to do. Uh, but I think there are sections where that kind of dialogue is happening. Uh, and uh, so it's not always addressed to the audience as the characters in the story. Uh, so I would say in response to your statement, yes, that it's a both and, uh, and that there is this variety of ways in which the story is developed and performed. Uh, which I think does leave open the possibility at points that we've got controversy stories that are not sympathetic uh, to the opponent. Right. Right. To put it in, uh, uh, in terms of the, for example, the dynamics that are present in the parable of the workers in the vineyard uh, in chapter 12, uh, I think there is a distinct uh, appeal on the part of the Markan storyteller for the audience to be alienated from the chief priests. Uh, and that uh, that portrayal of the chief priests, that uh, critique implicit in the telling of the story, has been seen by many Mark and scholars, uh, Merrill Miller was a, a close friend of mine in, uh, at Union, uh, and he sees that as anti-Jewish. Uh, and I, I think it's more likely that it's intra rather than anti. Mark, would you like to go? There we go. Um, thank you, Tom. And I'm sort of following up on what Marty says, coming in maybe a slightly different way. I suppose I've been swimming in these waters for long enough now with your work and Road and everybody that all of this seems to make a fairly obvious sense to me at this point. Uh, but one thing that, um, that I still question about this is you talk about how um, in the terms of the performance, the audience is invited to identify with the disciples more and more. Um, but the disciples are so bad in the gospel. So maybe I'm just kind of looking for the way, how do you talk about this that say, yes, we are supposed to identify and become like the disciples, but no, we're supposed to be better than the disciples and how that works in performance then, especially when we're dealing with an audience. And here's where maybe where I'm picking up on Marty's thing there that it's sort of the audience is more an observer and critiquer of the disciples rather than one who identifies with the disciples. Yes, so that's a uh, that's a major issue. In, uh, but I think that uh, my experience of the stories and uh, my analysis of the dynamics of distance is that if anything, what those elements of the characterization of, for example, Peter uh, are uh, an invitation to a higher degree of identification and sympathy. So in the, the climax of the characterization of, of Simon Peter uh, with uh, his denial, uh, the fact that it ends with his, uh, it's variously translated, beating on himself, uh, uh, grieving, uh, but that he wept uh, is a sign of the way in which this, the characterization is structured to create sympathetic identification with Peter because there is the recognition that's implicit in the story that I'm in the same position uh, and it will be uh, easy for me as a listener to deny any connection uh, 
with Jesus, and that that's an ongoing issue for every listener. And so at the end of the story, of course, as we've been talking about earlier here with the women there, um, but the women's failure, and you know, we don't know where the disciples are at that point. Uh, the women have been identified, of course, as ones who've ministered to Jesus all along, but right. where are we, where is the audience being left to identify by the end at 16 Yeah, well, there, I, I think it's, I think it's quite clear that they are invited to identify with the women and with their uh, uh, their mistaken decision to say nothing to anyone, not uh, and that the impact of the ending is to appeal to the listeners not to do that. That is to tell the story. Uh, and uh, so, uh, it is a it is a uh, an issue of audience dynamics in relation to the women. Uh, so there's the combination of, on the one hand, the recognition that what they are doing in being silent is wrong, but it's from a position of of sympathetic identification with the women, not uh, that they are somehow uh, enemies or a failure or something. Richard? First of all, thank you, Tom. This is, this is a, a powerful statement and an important one, and I'm looking forward to the volume of essays. Second of all, you know exactly what I'm going to say, because we've had the conversation about storytelling and drama many times, yes. but, but it does matter uh, partly because I work with, with actors, but it matters also because while you're right, Storytelling can be an entirely rhetorical activity where the speaker has aims and uh, carries out persuasion through the, through the telling of the story. That is an entirely appropriate use of story. But there is another use of storytelling, even with a solo storyteller, that is just as powerful. And I've seen it in uh, NBS uh, performances where the story is told because there's a puzzlement that the, the storyteller wants to draw the audience into, uh, where there's a, a, a question that the storyteller wants to leave the audience with. And that's different from uh, that. That means that, in fact, for that kind of storytelling, the fourth wall is very much in place uh, because the action is in itself puzzling and intriguing. Uh -huh. um, I think that's important. And probably I think it's important because I'm a student of Don Jewell, who was a student of Nils Dahl. And at the end of the day, the crucified Messiah is not something that I think the, the early Christian movement made any sense of for at least, well, three centuries. And Mark's earlier than that. Um, that means that I think Alongside, alongside your analysis, analysis, which I find exceedingly valuable, there needs to be attention to the possibility that when the women run away at the end, it's not, they're not judged for making a, a, one more wrong decision, but the puzzlement, but they, they run away to stir puzzlement about how in the world you, why in the world you would end the story of Jesus Christ, Messiah, this way. Um, and for that, you need not to have the audience identify with them. You need the audience to see them and say, what in the heck was that? Yes, but, uh, but not with what I would call hostility or accusation. Uh, I, of course, I'm, uh, I have, have deeply appreciated our ongoing uh, discussion about story and drama. And uh, I got out my, my thesis on a comparison of the parables of Jesus and the theatrical parables of Bertolt Brecht. Uh, and uh, Brecht's basic theory was that he wanted to develop epic drama, which was his metaphor was 
the reciting of the Homeric epics at, uh, at the great uh, feasts uh, versus uh, mimetic uh, drama, which had dominated Western civilization's development of uh, that genre. Uh, and that he wanted uh, drama that was more like storytelling. And, uh, and that in relation to characters, that he wanted the actors to present the characters rather than to identify with them, to uh, present them but standing back enough that you're, there would be some reflective distance uh, rather than the, uh, the catharsis of pity and fear, which was the Aristotelian, uh, I don't know, well, he saw it as the Aristotelian ideal. Uh, and so he wanted to develop it, uh, the drama in a different way. And I think that that's, uh, that's one of the things that your uh, work with the students uh, does is a kind of Brechtian uh, 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 portrayal. You know, I've, uh, I was the sponsor of your bringing the groups to SBO. And, uh, and that was one of the things that I noticed. And as I've, I got out my paper and started rethinking that article. Uh, I thought about Brecht and how uh, he would be a figure of interest for us in relation to our ongoing dialogue about story and drama. Well, he most certainly is. And for me, in fact, ever since Don Jewell <clears throat> handed me a copy of your thesis and said, Swanson, you got to read this. This is good. Uh, well, way to go, Don. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had met him. I've heard so much about him, and I never met him. And uh, so that's one of my losses. You two would have had wonderful conversations. Hmm. Yeah, you've kind of met him. Richard absorbed some of him, so uh, yes. Is, well, uh, that's his right. advisor. So, yep. Um, I want to work. <laughs> I, I want to shift to a different. So, Tom, one of the criteria you used was the length of the periods. Um, yes. that people spoke. And so I think the place where I think it's clearest that the audience is put in a particular role are on, in chapter four and chapter 13. It's kind of inevitable when you're hearing Jesus go on for 30 verses or 40 verses that you have to, you can be a resisting <laughs> person in the audience, but the, the story is structured at that point where the narrator continues to be Jesus and the audience is put in, in the first case, the, the, the listeners that are, are with the disciples and in the second place with the um, four who are asking of the apocalyptic questions. And so I think that's a really strong argument. Do you wanna comment on that? Well, what comes to what, what I was thinking as you were you know, talking about that is that uh, it's fully possible for members of the audience to respond to the appeals of the storyteller by saying, no, I don't believe this. I'm not interested. Uh, and that those places uh, in chapter four and 13 are possible places where uh, Mark can lose the audience uh, because, uh, because Jesus just goes on. Uh, it's even more of a challenge in the performance of John uh, with, you know, four chapters of, uh, and so I think there is a real possibility, uh, and I think a reality of what happened in the first century, that uh, there were significant numbers, uh, often pretty high percentage, of people who said, no, I'm not accepting that. I don't believe that. I don't, I'm not responding to that appeal. Uh, and that uh, the gospel may have been structured to appeal for a different thing, but the audiences were fully free 
to uh, reject the appeals. Um, I'll just note that for many people asked about the URLs that didn't work, Amelia has been good enough to post the Messiah piece URLs. I, if I'm correct, you can hear Tom both in Greek and in English um, through those links. It would be the chapters 14, 15, and 16, I believe, that you hear there. Um, Jason. I uh, just wanted to name one of the texts, one of the um, pieces in the chat from Robert Fowler, who said, I applaud Tom's reading of the fear and silence of the women at the end. Um, and I just wanted to echo that. And so to your whole point, Tom, of like this idea of the story giving us this, these op opportunities to see, you could go this way or you could, you could like respond differently. That's so powerfully, I mean, that's just, that's such a perfect way to encapsulate 16, chapter 16 in my mind and what the women do, right? Yeah. Like yeah. leaving with fear and trembling and then having the story in that way. Like I think you wrote like it implicitly invites us to imagine responding differently, right? As the audience. Yeah. But it's just what a stunning way to do it. I mean, I've seen I feel like I've watched that in real time. <laughs> yeah. Right. After yeah. after people have experienced the whole thing. So anyways, I just wanted to mine was also not a question, it was a comment. So if you want to respond to that. <laughs> well, in the book, there are four that you know by far the most uh concentrated exegetical focus from different angles is on 16.8 uh, and uh, arguing that it was the original intended ending and that there are multiple ways in which that becomes clear when it's analyzed as a story. Uh, the, uh, the last one is uh, the sound map uh, that in the uh, article on sound mapping that it becomes clear that the cola become increasingly short there is a uh, in 168 uh, that each of the cola becomes shorter uh, and that that is uh, a characteristic of uh, powerful, uh, speech rhetoric uh, and music. Uh, so uh, I haven't talked about that, but I think another thing that uh, all biblical scholars should be required to learn some instrument and uh, to approach uh, uh, the study of uh, the various parts of the scriptures musically. Uh, and that's one of the things that has gotten lost, is, which has been preserved in the traditions of rabbinic Judaism and uh, in the schools of uh, training in uh, candelation. I've, I've often wished that I had done that at uh, Hebrew Union in New York uh, while I was at Union. Um, I think just... musical sensitivity uh, provides often an analogy to what's happening in the stories. Uh, Mark has noted in, in our comments, uh, I agree that many times the you in Jesus' speech is addressed to the hearers of the gospel. I'd have to go through and count, but a quick survey shows that many of the you's are addressed to Jesus. That is, it seems that we can we can also talk about the audience is supposed to identify with Jesus rather than with the disciples. And here he points to Fowler's work. Yeah. Who's also present. Joanna. Got to unmute. Oh. Yep. Uh, piggyback on that. I think the dynamics of it, I argued this more in terms of literary, but also oral, is your the audience is invited to identify with Jesus in terms of value, but with the disciples in terms of the difficulty of following, that it is not a simple identification one way or the other, right? but different identifications with each. Yes. That's helpful. Yeah. Richard. I agree. My it's, a, 
it's a bit of a shift, but it's a question that's related to what we've been working on since the beginning. One of the things that I have appreciated about my association with everybody on the screen is your commitment to the necessity of oral performance and that these stories live when they are orally performed. But one of the things that I, I found fascinating that I found myself thinking about more than usual as I read the, the chapter for tonight, one of the things I found fascinating was, fascinating was that we are talking about a written script out of the ancient world that, uh, that Tom identifies as a resource for performers, which means that it will have been studied by performers the way um, we studied the gospels as literature, and then it will have been performed. So that there is, there is, there's a textuality, which again, the, when you invited us to perform for uh, SBL, it was in a session that looked at literary nature and uh, and oral and oral nature, yeah. but the the dance between um, between script and performance is one that I find really interesting. Yes. Yeah. Well, I agree. I think one of the uh, things that is happening in what I've called post literate culture, uh, which we are a part of with this increasing dominance of digital media is that there is more and more interest, dynamic, whatever, in popular culture, in sound, than there has been in the past. And that part of what we are doing is responding to a major cultural move that is happening uh, in the, uh, the disassociation of meaning from silent texts. Uh, but that's, uh, we're watching a lot of films these days and uh, it's a whole different, whole different thing than it was before movies. <laughs> if, if anybody who's an observer would like to be given a place where you can speak and be seen. I think we're at a place where we can do that. Um, for example, uh, Jennifer has made some great comments on the side. Uh, I'll read two of them. And if she wants to come up and use her own voice, she's allowed to. Uh, I need to elevate you, so you just need to ask me. And you can just ask everyone and I'll notice it. A generous reading is that Tom is presenting Mark as a manual for a missionary storyteller who is on a mission of peace to tell a Jewish story for a world that is being persuaded by the logic of violence. And then I wonder whether we might identify with the Mark, with Mark the storyteller who is clearly a disciple of Jesus and is taking the risk, what is the level of risk at this time, to tell the story even to audiences that might be oppositional, resistant, fearful, violent, one could add. Yes. Boy, that sounded, that all sounded good to me. Okay, let me elevate you there. I think that's one of the ongoing issues that has not received the degree of attention that it deserves in the interpretation of Mark is the degree to which it is a nonviolent gospel and that the contrast between the dominant messianic tradition of David and Saul as the great warriors, uh, Saul has slain his thousands and David is ten thousands, uh, that, uh, that the contrast between that and Jesus' move is, is very much in the background of the impact and appeal of the story, but that was has been soundly rejected, uh, especially by the major elements of the Christian church. Jennifer, if you'd and like that it doesn't, get to, it doesn't get talked about much. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't see much about nonviolence and 
component marketing discussion. So it's one of the things I really liked about what you read from Jennifer. Jennifer's gonna use her own voice now. <laughs> Thanks, Phil, and thank you so much, Tom, for this article. Um, I'm I'm trying to imagine, and it's all right with me if it's a bit speculative, but I'm trying to imagine the context in which um, this eventually gets written down. But it seems like Mark has this story to tell and is in some context for telling it, and then it becomes a written text to um, encourage others who are going to also be able to tell this story in, in a coherent way, in a way that, that moves an audience, like you're saying, from perhaps a place of opposition or just um, critique or questioning to drawing closer to really being committed. And so I'm, I'm curious about how you imagine the context for Mark the Evangelist. Um, how large do you imagine the audiences to be? What level of risk might you imagine for Mark? And, and then what happens in the passion story? Because I think that's where you're gonna, that's where the question of whether revolutionary violence is gonna be uh, worth your <laughs> your allegiance or not. And, right. and it seems to me like the gospel is saying, don't go there, but it's, a, it's an option that plenty of people might choose. So I'm just kind of wondering how you imagine that change takes place. Well, uh, we have, uh, I think we have not done a good job as uh, New Testament scholars in uh, exploring uh, the context of the Gospels in the post-war uh, decades uh, when the Gospels were composed, and uh, and what were what were the motives? What was the energy behind this amazing degree of literary output that happened in this uh, fledgling sectarian uh, Jewish movement uh, that uh, was characterized by reaching out to and including their enemies, uh, the Romans, and the uh, that one of the great ironies of history is that uh, Rome became the center of, uh, of this movement and, uh, and is still called, I noticed it today on a sign. Uh, so I was driving and thought of that. But it was, it was uh, Mother of Mercy, a Roman Catholic church was on the sign. And, and I thought of that in relation to the uh, the, the degree to which that is an incredible transformation from the war and the uh, persecution of the followers of Jesus. So yes, there was significant risk in telling the story, I think. Uh, and, uh, but I, I, I'd, I'd say one of the areas that I would encourage us as a seminar to go is to explore uh, the very question that you're asking. What were the dynamics of this in the context of the post-war decades? Uh, and what was it about uh, Mark? I think that my own conclusion about that is that it was a response to the growing power of literate culture. And that uh, the recognition on the part of Mark and then Mark's uh, followers, uh, Matthew and Luke and then John, that they were writing to cast the gospel in a way that could be heard by 
particular segments of the uh, of the community of Israel and of the Roman uh, community in the aftermath of the war and those decades. I think about that, the analogy that I think about often is Vietnam. Uh, you know, that was such an important uh, thing for the, uh, for the young men of my generation. Uh, I had a close friend who, with whom I had uh, a whole series of passionate arguments about whether it was necessary for us to support uh, American policy, regardless of how we have evaluated it. And Russ, uh, out of conviction, uh, signed up and was killed in the Tet Offensive. Uh, and uh, so I, uh, the, these decisions and the things that are implicit in the gospel are very, uh, uh, they become specific, they become personal. Uh, it's not just, uh, you know, a theological construct, it's decisions that people make uh, that become uh, decisions of life and death. Um, I have a autobiographical pastoral <laughs> uh, reflection, I think, that I, I'm inclined to think that this is a story that the followers of Jesus told to each other so that they could get back on the way with Jesus. Um, that, and that more often than not, it reminded them that they were off the way than that it got them on the way. Um, just, you know, the like middle section autobiographically, I know what greatness is about, but I forget it daily. Um, and so I think there's a, a chance that Mark's gospel functioned very much the way you said Jeremiah and the Exodus did to get people who said, this is where I'm putting my, <laughs> my faith back in the way, or at least to recognize, man, this way is clearly God's because if it depends on me, yeah. it's not going anywhere. Yeah. And so, um, I don't know for what it's worth, that's my reflection as a pastor and as a human being that it'd be nice if I saw the women being silent and thought, you know, tomorrow I'm gonna go out and tell this story. Uh, but, you know, I've seen too many tomorrows to think that that, to be too naive about how easily that happens. So. Yeah. Well, one of the, uh, that resonates with me, what you're saying. Uh, I, a question that I'd ask the group, I guess, is why is it that uh, we as a discipline, uh, as a group of scholars have had so much difficulty in talking about evangelism, uh, in part because of the horror of what evangelism has become, uh, but in relation to the first century, uh, it's not a forbidden topic. Uh, it's something that we could address. And I wonder what it is uh, about New Testament scholarship that has this, you know, I, I almost never see uh, discussion about uh, early Christian evangelism. I, I mean, my gut response is that but the story only became compelling to people because there were some people who actually did <laughs> hear the message, realize, oh, we're not in the right way and move themselves into it. That it was the lived testimony of people saying, we're not gonna respond with violence, even though we understand that impulse mm -hmm. that was compelling to people. And then they said, why, why are you people like that? And the story became a way then to talk about the practices that the the early Jesus followers had adopted, um, but I suspect it was the it was compelling. The evangelistic thrust was 
um, heart message, but primarily a lived testimony to the having your heart captive to a particular way of living that Jesus opened up to us. Yeah. And a receptivity to the to the reign of God as he proclaimed it. Mm. Kathy? Yeah, something to follow up on what Phil said. Um, and thanks, Tom. Oh, I just lost you on my screen. There you are. Thanks again for this good work. Um, I'm going to jump out of Mark for just a second and just make a really brief comment that, you know, if we look at at least the way that Luke portrays Peter's sermon in Acts chapter two, he's sort of retelling in part his audience's own story. And it's a recasting of that story that then sort of seems to have this evangelistic effect on the audience where they, they're able to see their own story in a different way. And I guess maybe maybe that kind of dovetails into what Phil's saying about how Mark's audience in some way and as, and as, as future audiences of Mark hear that story, they then hear their own story again anew, right? With that second naivete and that maybe sometimes that's just as powerful if not more powerful than, than a brand new story. To kind of hear, hear ourselves told a different way. Well, it certainly happened that the gospel tradition became uh, stories that were told within uh, communities of followers of Jesus. Uh, but it's uh, part of what uh, I think happens with the telling of the stories is that it uh, that there's an ongoing learning experience and discipleship formation that happens in the hearing and telling of the stories that only emerges with years of engagement. Uh, that's been the case with me. Uh, and, uh, and I think it has been with uh, many in the seminar is that uh, the practice of recovering the primacy of memory, of interiorization, of telling these stories changes people uh, and uh, gives vitality to these stories that doesn't exist otherwise. So I, I, I see that. And your work on the audiences has really illuminated a, you know, a lot of that. Uh, and I think bears more uh, room for development of that. So I, I hope that's happening. <laughs> I will note that um, one of the workshops at the festival gathering will be on the neglected character of the audience in um, I don't remember if it's a particular gospel that he's working on, but it's Cliff is going to be doing that. And so yes. you probably well, got an if you're uh, going to the festival gathering, I assume everyone else got an email recently that says these are the workshops that'll be offered. And so uh, do take a look at that. Um, Pam said in the Pamela said in the uh, chat. I think there's a cultural overlay about evangelism. We automatically hear it as building a church which is not the same as fishing for people. Huh. Right. In our congregation, we've been trying to, it's been a struggle for people. We've been trying to say, we're, we're gonna go out and talk to people and ask them God questions instead of church questions. It is not a custom, at least in my context. And <laughs> I had some people who were deeply offended that you would talk about something as personal with people as God. And it was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, deeply, I mean, deeply, deeply offended. Not, not all people and some people, you know, bought in, but it was. Highly controversial. Highly controversial. And it wasn't even like telling them, this is what I think. It was asking them, what is your experiences with God? Very yeah. disturbing. Yeah. Well, I will, um, I think, I feel like we're at a point. If anyone wants to ask one more question or make one more speech or Tom, if you want to, that this is an appropriate time to do it. 
I will save the chat. Somebody asked me to do that. Um, so I'm going to put my email in and you're going to flood my box if you want to have a link uh, to this when it's recorded. And if you want to, um, if you want the chat, you can do that. I will send it out to the seminar members. So you, you all don't have to do that flooded little list that way. Joanna. Oh, that was just the, that, yeah, that was your real hand. You weren't raising your hand. Do you, do you have an idea of when the book is coming out, Tom? Uh, Whiff and Sock is very fast uh, in the turnaround. So uh, if I can figure out how to uh, uh, load Adobe Reader and get the text in that so I can make uh, the few changes that are needed in the index. Uh, I expect it would be within a month. Could you tell uh, us the name again, the title again? Uh, First Century Gospel Storytellers and Audiences. Gospels as Performance Literature. I thought of uh, having the title being the difference that performance makes. And there's a way in which this essay uh, is an example of that. Uh, but uh, I applaud, oh, go ahead. I applaud your first, your second title if you want people who aren't already interested in performance to read it. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Well, I'm not. Uh, uh, I'm not very optimistic about having a uh, a major readership. Uh, if that happens, it will take time. Uh, but the work well, of the seminar is really having an impact. So I, I, I'm very appreciative and grateful to all of you for entering into this conversation and taking uh, this uh, essay and, and, uh, and I hope uh, the book uh, seriously. Uh, it's been hard to generate a conversation about uh, these matters. And so I'm really, really grateful to all of you. Uh, for this conversation. Well, grateful to you, Tom. Yes, and we thank you, Tom. Well. <laughs> whatever else, wh whoever else reads it, whatever else readership you get, you created this thing. It's amazing. So. Yeah. Well, and your argument is that hearing was more important than reading for the life of the gospel. And that there is no, uh, no argument against the fact that people are hearing the gospels and the scriptures more because of your work than will ever read your chapters. <laughs> uh, and, and if you had to choose, we know which one you'd choose. And so... Um, right. I'm going to ask, uh, just so we know that this isn't just uh, our group thing, I'm going to ask Fausto if he can talk about the next thing that the Guatemalan Bible Society is going to be taking on over, over three years in relation to the conversation we've been having, if he's willing. Sorry, can you repeat? Good off because of yeah. the sure. internet here. Sure. Um, you want to tell them what the next project of the Guatemalan Bible Society is going to be? Or should I? <laughs> yes. Uh, hello, everybody. And thank you for, for this conversation. Thank you, Tom, for what you're doing and what you've been doing for years. Um, so Phil and I have been involved in this project with uh, orality and working with three uh, major languages, translating, which what uh, at the end of this year will be 24 stories from the Old Testament, 
23 from, from the Old Testament, one from Luke. For, and for the next three years, we will translate uh, uh, and these uh, translation teams will learn the book of Mark. So in their languages, for them will be the first, we'll have this, uh, the whole book of the New Testament. Wow. So they, uh, I think from one of the three groups of the New Testament, the other groups don't have any uh, other scripture. So uh, Phil and I are figuring out <laughs> how, uh, will be the best way to accomplish this. But uh, we are in this point where, uh, you know, the teams are ready and they there's a uh, sense of expectation of uh, what is next. And so if you can uh, please pray for that and we will keep you posted on next steps. Well, there will be 14, 14 people whose primary language is either Ishil, Mam, or Sipacapense, three different indigenous languages who will be internalizing over a three-year period the whole gospel, not to translate it, but to translate it from story Spanish storytelling into their indigenous language telling. And so it will have it shot at being evangelistic, <laughs> uh, Tom, in their own context. So. Anyway, a little commercial uh, from, from our end, but... Uh, thank you so much, everybody. For that's great that that's here. happening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I hope uh, you are all well. And uh, if you're a seminar member, your year to date things are probably due about now. And send those to oh, yes. uh, Megan Wines, please. So, um, if you have any questions about anything in terms, if you're a seminar member, about what you're supposed to be getting ready for for the uh, end of the month, please email me. Uh, thank you so much, Tom, for your ongoing work, but especially for what you've shared tonight. My joy. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thanks,